Everyone and welcome back to episode five of season three. For those that like fingers to help them count, of sight to be with you. I'm incredibly excited for this episode. My guests, they are absolutely legendary, adding yet more to the plethora of beautiful accents that I've had on the show. That I'm incredibly shared to to share with you all. We're gonna once again hear some incredible things. Uh, I'm going to stop blabbing on because this isn't, it's my podcast, but it's not about me. <clears throat> my very special guest, if you could please just introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. Brilliant. So my name is Annie Valkama, or if we were to pronounce it correctly, but very few English speaking people actually can. In Finnish, we would say Annie Valkama, but either way works. Uh, most people use Annie. Um, so yeah, I work in the video games industry. I am currently what at Super Rare Games. So I work at Super Rare Games. Uh, as a head of keeping on brand. So at Super Rare Games, we're all kind of ahead of something. Uh, but what that means in kind of proper business terms is that I do a bits of PR, I do a bits of I do bits of branding, and I do a bits well, I do bits of marketing. Um, and it's taken it took me oh dear three years to break into the video games industry. It's it's always been kind of a passion field for me, but I didn't actually realize that I could turn my the passion for gaming into something I could actually earn a paycheck from. So um, originally I am from Finland um, and not, well, it is a big city by Finnish standards, but the, when I grew up, I didn't even consider gaming as something that I could turn into a career really. Um, and I am, st I, st I don't know how it is these days, but at, at least back when, so I was born in 1997, so I'm 26 years old, but back when I was a kid, gaming was still very much the kind of hobby that got looked down upon. Like you get those kind of stereotypes of like, oh, someone who is incredibly antisocial, doesn't work, lives in their mom's basement kind of thing. So when I was growing up, I was often told that I should not mention gaming as my hobby because it would kind of create those negative connotations. So I, a lot of my childhood was like thinking like, like oh, gaming isn't really a hobby. Like a hobby is a thing that's things like oh you do like a you do football or you do rugby or you play ice hockey or something you know social where you go about and meet new meet other people so that's in a long long-winded way of who i am and why i do what i do <laughs> love it getting really straight into the heart of the podcast uh we'll end the episode there no i'm joking um, <laughs> um okay so that's great so so just so just your job title again head of yeah. keeping on brand yes that sounds like a great way of getting you to do more than one job but for only one paycheck. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, so Super Rare Games is a really kind of young company. It's all, it turned five this year, so it's only started quick maths. I, got, I was good at maths in school. Uh, 2018. 2018, Super Rare Games started. Um, and it started out kind of like a... It's like a phys limited physical games publisher. So people may have heard of companies like Limited Run Games, Strictly Limited. So we were kind of in that same sphere initially. And for like the first four-ish years of Super Rare Games, that's all we really did. Um, but in the so last last year in January 2022, we announced our kind of original publishing label. Um, and our workload has kind of grown tremendously since then, because now we still do the limited physical publishing stuff, but now we also do original stuff. So 
and we are still quite a small team. So as it comes with small teams, we do kind of juggle the bits and pieces. But as Super Air, we've been quite lucky in the last year that our marketing team has like doubled. I used to look after, for example, all our social media stuff, but now we have a dedicated community manager who just does all that. Okay, well, that's that's excellent. I think you know it's a it's a really interesting way to sort of look at things, and you you touched on this yourself. I remember sort of being in in even college, sort of a you know, sort yeah. of sixteen to eighteen period, as we refer to it here, and like you know being told, like, well, you Chris, you're never going to get into the games industry. People that are doing that are going to have been doing it their whole life and are never going to stop. Mm. Um, mm. And that was in 2010, so like you know, just before indie games like became a thing. Um, yeah. That's why I never sort of pursued games as a career, which is why I choose to research them instead, because I thought that was a nice workaround. Yeah. Sounds very exciting, though. <laughs> you don't know many academics, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so, to be fair, to go on that point, so before I joined uh, joined video games, I worked at Oxford University Press, and I worked in academic publishing. So while I didn't work with academics directly, I worked with librarians a lot. And before I went into that job, I actually did work in like higher education. <laughs> Not as a teacher, but I worked at the university I graduated from. So I have some experience in the like academic field, just not directly. <laughs> in which case, I apologise. I meant to burn myself and inadvertently burned you. Um, also, I'm sorry for your time at Oxford. That's a that's a classicist joke because, you know, the South. Uh, and I'm from Liverpool. For, for regional listeners that don't quite get that joke. Uh, you laughed, and that's all that matters because you're the guest. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, for also, me, because I mean, I'm not from... academic publishing. I'm trying to work out if that makes you the bad guy or not. Well, if it makes you feel better, I didn't really feel like I fit in in my role in particular, because, um, well, if you are watching this podcast, you can see how I look like, and I don't exactly look like the kind of person you may think when you're thinking of someone who works at Oxford University Press. So I was definitely a bit of a black sheep in the marketing team there. Um, for for the benefit of the listeners, would you be comfortable describing yourself? Uh, yeah, so I would describe myself as goth. So I have kind of, I have longish green hair. I have a side shave on one side of my hair. Um, I wear quite strong makeup. I have black eyeliner, dark lipstick, and I am currently wearing like a collared top that has a lovely, very family friendly picture of some sort of demonic creature. <laughs> lovely. So very, I'd say that's actually very suitable for Oxford University Press. <laughs> More jokes. Um, okay, lovely. I I realised I'd never actually asked anyone to describe themselves before. That was actually quite strange. Good job. Uh, I do believe you're uh, fair to yourself as a strong goblin. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't. I I think the goblin part comes from the fact that I do have green hair. Uh, literally, nothing else to do with the fact that it's goblin. I just think of goblins and they're green. And I like taking slight kind of dicks at myself every now and then. It's healthy to be able to laugh at yourself, you know. Um, so I mean, yes, you're, you're basically British if you can self-deprecate. That's how we that's how we live. <laughs> I think Finland and the UK might have that in common. Exquisite. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for the strong part, uh, it's probably something I might talk a bit more later, depending on how the conversation goes. But yeah, so the strong part comes from the fact that one of the things I do outside of games is that I am actually a power lifter. It's a, um, something I am pursuing quite seriously at the moment. I'm actually hoping to eventually compete. Um, so yeah, that's where the kind of strong goblin thing comes from. And then people online have just kind of rolled with it. <laughs> So you heard it here first, exclusively on this show, and he will be on World's Strongest Person in a few years. Olympics, oh, yeah. maybe? Yeah, who knows? If if games doesn't work out, I'll just become an Olympic athlete, because it's easy. You just just do it, really. I mean, in this economy, let's be honest, you need to do both jobs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's funny, because it's cripplingly, cripplingly true. Anywho, <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> so we we we've uh, met uh, a couple of times. I sort of know you through sort of safe in our world. We were at the uh, yeah. Halloween party charity event together. That was cool. Yes. You and uh, Rosie, also previous guest on the show. Shout out to Rosie, legend. Um, we're a Kim Possible duo costume. Incredible. <clears throat> um, 
But this chat kind of came about because you were sort of talking about on Twitter um, about sort of being from working class backgrounds, which obviously mm-hmm. something that resonated with me. Um, yeah. I very much frequently, I like to frame it as in checking my privilege, but also really shouting about the fact that I'm working class, very passionate about that and getting into the gaming industry. So yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned a few of the jobs there. Can we sort of mm-hmm. go back a little bit and talk about that? career plan like why did we go through those steps why did we want to get into games beyond it being cool yeah of, of course so so yeah my family background is i do come from a working class family um i'll bet i know there's again there's a lot of privilege in the fact that i was lucky enough to kind of be born and grow up in finland where obviously just the social care and things are a lot better i do apologize to interrupt that's... you there <clears throat> for for benefit of just someone who clearly is too privileged to know i feel like we should explain what working class is because <laughs> like the class system in britain is in of itself a thing right we could have a debate yeah. about that but like essentially yeah. it means that you know like you're you know typically both your parents had to work to make ends meet <clears throat> you're you were expected to get a job typically as soon as you could to assist the household that kind of thing there's a lot more nuance to it but like you know mm-hmm. the emphasis was the you would have to work is is that a fair definition yeah yeah i think there's no like universal definition for working class the one that i kind of learned for at school is similar to kind of what you said and it's largely people who work things they work like well they work paycheck to paycheck they may work part-time or like or things like that and generally they are people who work those kind of i guess quote unquote blue collar physical labor type of jobs much better see i honestly i was like we're gonna have this whole discussion it'll be great did not look up any definitions didn't think about it because i was like i know what this means like we could just <laughs> spend 90 minutes dunking on tories that'd be great um <laughs> so like we we did not get in some of the nuances there um <clears throat> apologies so finland no. growing up yes yeah so uh yeah so i grew up in finland in a working class family we like I said, I was lucky in the sense that I was born in Finland. I would not have gotten all the opportunities that I have if I hadn't been born in Finland because my family simply would not have been able to provide me with the kind of opportunities that I have had. Like if we lived in the UK, no way could my family put me in a private school, which seems like a necessity in some parts of the UK if you want to get into a good university. Um, so I lucky in that sense. But yeah, at the same time, my family did struggle quite a bit growing up. Um, so my mom was a single mom for a lot, little while, taking care of me. And I have a older half sister who is t- 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 six years older than me. She's in her thirties now. Um, but then kind of my stepdad uh, s- stepped into the picture when I was about two, three years old and he's been around ever since. Um, but yeah, growing up. Um, so first of all, in my family, I am currently the, in my immediate family, the only person who has, first of all, even graduated high school or college, whatever it's called in the UK. Uh, in Finland, we call it the upper secondary school, which sounds very fancy. Um, fancy. But it was the first. I was the first person to even do that, and then I kind of won up that by then getting myself a university degree, and not only getting myself a university degree, but getting my degree in a foreign country. Um, uh, so it's been it's it's been a hard 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 life, but I was I w- I always loved studying. Um, unfortunately, I went through a childhood where I was bullied quite a lot. Um, first, it started. So I'm wearing glasses. I've ha- I've been cross-eyed my entire life. So that's the thing. That's what started my bullying when I was younger. Um, then I was a, I was quite I was quite a bit heavier than all the other kids. So then people started bullying my weight. So kind of when I was a kid, I felt like, okay, my smarts is the only thing I have. So I'm going to focus on that. Um, I resonate yeah, with that so... on pretty much every level at this point. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> uh, so just, just wanted to share that there. Like, yeah, I, this yeah. this is this is bringing back a lot of memories. Oh, I'm sorry. But at it's the fine. same time, it's not, it's, a, yeah. <laughs> it's not your, it's not your, it's but, not fine, but it's not your fault. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I mentioned, I, so I'm, so I, graduated upper secondary school or high school in 2016 when I was 19 um, and pretty much the summer after that I moved to the UK um, but even prior to that so first of all because of my family background there was no support they were able to provide me in terms of like moving to a different country so I started working when I was 17 years old and the little known facts about Finland is that while we have three 
uh, free schooling for kids, by the point you get to high school, you don't actually get your books. And I believe nowadays you are even required to have a laptop. I believe there might be some funding opportunities for students who cannot buy themselves a laptop. But when I was in school, we had to buy our own books. And ah, obviously because of my background. Lovely. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can buy them secondhand. They were still very expensive. So my mom couldn't always pay the books I needed. So I started working at the age of 17. A lot of my friends thought it was like, oh, you have so much disposable income. But it was literally to pay for my education. So I worked my career path, I guess, started as a housekeeper. I worked at a very high end hotel, which was an experience in and of its own, coming from a poor background. There's uh, going to be some stories sure we the... can get into there. <laughs> oh, boy, I would have I have lots of stories about that type. Uh, so I worked in a hotel for about just under two years. And then before my graduation, I quit that job because I, I've had enough. It was too much work too little pay and the hours we worked overtime hours all the time uh but then throughout that summer before i moved i then did like a summer job i also i worked as a cleaner at a local college a much more pleasant because the students weren't around we were basically just making sure the school was in tip-top shape shape when the students came back in august um but yeah following that i then moved to the uk in september of 2019 so 2019 2016 sorry so I have now lived here for seven years and people frequently ask me, why on earth have you stuck around? Um... <laughs> it's a valid question. <laughs> I can go into that a bit more. Uh, but yeah, so I moved here and I went to do my degree at Loughborough University, which people immediately start to think, ooh, sports, ooh, engineering. Um, I did neither of those. Uh, my degree was in history and international politics, hence why I have familiarity with how to disc how to define the working class. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, and again, well, that degree has nothing to do with my job now, but I very much enjoyed my degree. I've always approached education. I did my degree and that also had ups and downs because I was completely reliant on a student loan I got from Finland, which is currently a pain in my neck to pay back because the payments are very different to the UK system. But I, in during my degree, I went through a, basically every single summer, my student loan payments would end. And because I lived in East Midlands in a small town that was primarily the businesses were up kept by students. So in the summer when students weren't around, they wouldn't really hire staff, part-time staff. And even with my three years of experience as a cleaner, even those jobs wouldn't even interview me. Uh, so make of that what you will. <laughs> Definitely not to so do I... with like a systematic racism problem in the UK or anything. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think I also just want to uh, quickly just for, for perspective, like, you know, moving moving cities in the UK is seen as a big thing for, for university. You don't yeah. want to go too far from home. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's an absolute baller move to just be, yeah, I'm going to go to a country um, just with, with their, you know, no, no sort of like uh, monetary support, you know, and just do yeah. the thing. That like, that takes, you know, some, some, some big old math rocks to do. Um, especially when like, you know, Again, it's worth pointing out, but like international students are charged more than home students in the UK for tuition fees and things mm. like that. So like, mm. um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's it, like it's a big decision, but it has even more gravitas, I think, when, when you hear people that have had that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And that's then there's also some kind of connotations that came with that, because obviously the immediate assumption is, OK, international student, they have the wealthy parents that have, have placed them here. Whilst for me it was it was the total opposite. I I genuinely like my family was maybe during the summers where my income completely ended, they could give me, I don't know, fifty euros, hundred euros here and there. But I I genuinely went through summers like the first summer after my first year of university, I had 
200 pounds for the entire summer. So that was three months. My landlord was lovely enough to let me pay my rent very delayed when my student loan payments kicked in again in September. But I went through that entire summer with basically 200 pounds on my account. And that's what I have for that entire period. And we would call that heavy salad. <laughs> but again, I mean, you know, you, you you did the thing you you managed you you were driven by like yeah the the passion to to want to stay and to want to do the thing which i think is really commendable yeah yeah if um, you were going to do a master's what would you do it in that's, that's a question uh yeah so my f so my undergraduate dissertation was on kind of japanese history i've always been really passionate about japan as a culture as a country the history the language just all nine yards and unsurprisingly i'm also into anime but it's it's to more than just the usual like oh i like pretty pictures i just like japan is very fascinating to me so <laughs> no, i did my dissertation hold on. people hear anime they go oh like Yu Gi Oh, like dragon Ball. Like, yeah, like, no no booty pics. it's not just the booty pics i'm now beginning to think maybe it is the booty pics it depends on the mood, you know. There's a lot of genres to anime. <laughs> yes, yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I did my dissertation on Japanese history, was specifically the World War II era. Um, in my second year, I did wrote like an essay about um, the kind of this is where a trigger warning would come in, but like the sex slavery during World War II. So I discovered that kind of his part of Japan in my second year of uni. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. We don't really talk about that aspect of Japan because when you talk about Japanese history during World War II, I was like, okay, so they got, they got, they dropped the at atomic bomb there. So they're more, a bit more like the victims, but there's actually quite a lot of stuff that happened during the war. Um, and then I kind of tied that period into kind of Japanese national identity. So if you talk about the World War history in Japan these days, especially like, the conservative government there they have very, some of them just outright deny that some of the things happened some of they insist that they have already like compensated the countries that they that fell victim to these crimes there's a lot of heated debate there and it still very much impacts kind of like japan's relations with china south korea and like philippines all these countries so that's a long-winded way of saying if i went to do my masters i would probably do it in something like japanese studies um, whether that would be the language or again culture or history, that's up in the air. So I was gonna say that sounds really cool, and then realize I need to preface <laughs> that with not the horrible war crimes, but the doing that as a master subject. Because um, I mean, yeah. like, and I say this as a Brit, you know, people like to position themselves as good or bad. When in actual fact, whenever you get to war, pretty much everyone is probably the bad guy. Yeah, you know, absolutely. because that's how war works i actually had a conversation with someone just the other day and i was doing this sort of very british profusely apologizing for nothing thing and uh, the message was like in all caps was like quit being so british and i instantly just replied with i'm not trying to colonize anyone <laughs> too much aplomb oh Cause, yeah because <laughs> i th i think i'm funny they thought it was funny it was a great time but like you know <laughs> that's how you know brits operate so i also want to point out like i love japan as well it's on like my bucket list yeah. to visit um one of the things i definitely want to do i think i uh, do not know as much i'm gonna clarify that but i've always been fascinated by the country and the culture and things like that yeah. and obviously it's you know the home of of so much gaming content that i enjoy as well oh, yeah, um, absolutely. so we've gone through like you know <clears throat> undergraduate degree you stayed in the mm. uk yeah you mentioned a few of those sort of like jobs um at what point did you realize that it was games and and how did you go about getting into games yeah uh so after my second year of uni my university by default offered the option of taking doing like a placement year so working in the industry for a year so i was like okay i'll look into this um although it's notoriously difficult to find a placement job with kind of my degree background unless you're going into something like trying to apply to work at the par parliament or some other like uh, bureaucratic institution um so it was then that when i was looking around and it just kind of randomly popped into my head was like oh i wonder if any like games companies offer any placements um and i believe i applied for so ea back then offered a placement i uh, placements i don't know if they do still but they offered them then obviously i didn't get it um 
but it was kind of from that point on that I then, then started thinking, and especially when my final year of uni kicked in, I was like, huh, I don't really know what I want to do specifically, but it would be amazing if it was in video games. Um, so it kind of was like, I'd say December of my final year of university, so this was 28, late 2018, um, that I started then applying for games industry jobs. And it was from that point until December of 2021, when I finally got my current job that I'm at, at Super Rare Games. But in, in between, um, which is going to divert the topic, but I was I was homeless for a little while. So the day I graduated university with my first class honors degree, I was actually homeless at that point. On yeah. the degree, just uh, clarification. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I was very lucky that I was able to stay with friends during that period that I was homeless. But yeah, I I did not have a home of my own. I did not have money, and I was constantly looking for jobs. Um, funnily enough, I had the same situation happen twice. So as in, like, I wasn't homeless twice, but so when I was homeless, I was applying for two jobs. One was an internship at the university I graduated from, and the other one was a games industry job. Um, at a at a company, uh, <laughs> one one men, name which company. Um, but I actually had to pull out of that application process, even though it was quite promising, because I was offered the internship. And at that point, I really had to w- decide between okay, I can have this job guaranteed. I can get money. I can get my own place again. And like, or do I keep pursuing this thing that might not lead into anything? So that happened once, and then the following year. When my when the pandemic started, which is a, a whole other topic, um, my internship was approaching an end, and I was again just relentlessly applying for games jobs, and there was an internship in games again in a in an unnamed company. Um, haven't heard many good things about said company, um, but yes, there was a that narrows it down. Some... Not very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jokes. Yeah. yeah. So there was an internship I was applying for, and then the Oxford University Press, a marketing assistant position, and that was offered to me. So again, it was between, okay, I can take this job now and start getting paid again, or do I keep up with this interview process? I could have probably accepted the job and still kept up with the interview process, but at that point, it was mid-pandemic. I was very tired, very depressed. I'd been applying for jobs for months, so at that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to take this job now and just do it for a little while well i think a really important point there is and, and this is going to tie into i think talking about some some of the working class elements in, in this kind of process and mm-hmm. but like it, it's it takes it firstly it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to pursue yeah. jobs and applications and interviews yeah. and um obviously maybe less applicable during the pandemic time but like there's a sometimes a cost benefit as well like you, oh, yeah. you might want you to go to an in-person interview that's travel yeah. depending on where it is like you need the accommodation and like yeah. you're still kind of like rolling the dice at that point which is you know yeah. i think particularly when you've had an offer that is a, a in ink offer it's it's really hard to choose bet- between like essentially like some semblance of security or hope yeah so um it's i, I feel like i'm kind of getting wax lyrical but how did you think like you know your your living situation was like a okay i can put the the dreams on hold you know i can i I can keep pursuing this later because you're like you have you felt like you had to pick the job kind of thing yeah so on in the first instance it was obviously it was obvious i was homeless i was staying with friends so i was like i felt they they genuinely did not mind but in a way you obviously you will feel bad you're like i am here i am contributing i'm paying no bills i am barely even paying my own food so you don't kind of want to not like overstay your welcome so to speak so that was the case in the first instance i just needed to get on my feet again um and in the second instance it was again the pandemic so 2020 was a really rough year for me in general i'd say it was probably the toughest year of my life i lived in so i lived alone i got furloughed from my internship in march i was in basically in total isolation during the the toughest of the lockdowns i had no human interactions with anyone i was completely by myself um so in uh, i i did a lot of kind of disaster thinking in that period out up uh, basically unwillingly unwillingly and when it approached the kind of end of my internship like the last month of my internship i was lucky enough to keep getting paid while i was furloughed because i did work at the university um 
uh, by get to got to that last month of internship with I still didn't have a job. So I was like, oh my God, if I don't have a job when my internship ends, I'm an immigrant in this country. I will not be able to pay, pay my rent. All my friends who were still at uni have now graduated. They have moved out of out of Loughborough where I was still living. My like, if I don't have a job, I don't have money. I can't keep my home. Will my only option literally be to basically move back to Finland? After and the I UK has kinda... no problem sending people on planes these days. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. More political dark humor. Sorry, you were telling a story <laughs> that actually matters and is the purpose of this podcast. Uh, but yeah, so basically that's the point I got to. And um, while I, I, Finland is a wonderful country, I always encourage people to visit. It's a, it's beautiful, especially in the summers and the winters. But for me, it's, it's because I did move here when I was 19. So fresh out of high school, I had lost, I have lost touch with a lot of my friends from back though, back in, back in the day. And I've moved here. I basically, I built my network here. My, most of my kind of in-office professional work history is here, my friends are here, so obviously for me it was like I have built a life for myself here. So the thought of I'm gonna lose everything and I'm gonna basically have to move back to Finland to live with my mom and then basically try and find a job there, it just felt felt like the worst case scenario. So when the Oxford University press job came up, I was like, okay, I am willing to put my dream of working in the games industry aside again and take this job. And the way I kind of approached that, that while it, well, it, it sucked a little bit, but because I was then already looking into getting into marketing jobs, um, and Oxford University Press is obviously a, n- a known name. So I was approaching it in a way like, okay, I'll take this job. Maybe it will be then easier for me to get a games industry job in a year or two. Now, when I have the, some of the marketing experience and I have a known organization on my CV, even if it's not games. Okay, <clears throat> I think that that makes a lot of sense. I feel like I, I, I can get the steps in that journey, and I think <clears throat> I think it's just again to reiterate, it's just about like you had you made the decisions that you had to more than you wanted to, mm. and that is the epi- like that is the epitome of just having to make choices to yeah. survive. I guess like you know survive and mm-hmm. not thrive, and I you know what I mean <clears throat> because yeah. platitudes. Um, so let's let's turn the dial in a little bit more and talk about some of the the cool beans. We see the opportunity, super rare games. Yep. We, what were you thinking during that like interview process? Like, we thinking like, is it like, is this it? Is it finally gonna happen? Like, it's 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 very kind of cynical and very pessimistic to say, but because I'd been applying for three years at that point, not constantly, but pretty on off, and I'd been rejected probably by like a hundred plus jobs in the UK. So at that point, I was pretty much like, oh, I'll apply for this, but I don't have very high ex- expectations because everything, everyone else has turned me down. Um, but then I had the interview at Super Rare Games. So I was first interviewed by George Perkins, who is the founder slash CEO of the company, although they hate being called the CEO. Uh, they absolutely despise that word. Um, but I was first interviewed by then, and it was immediately one of the best interview experiences I've had. Because it's like at Super Rare Games, what we do is we, part of the interview is what George literally calls a vibe check. So it was literally just us talking about like, oh, what makes you like games so much? What sort of indie games have you played recently? What are some of your favorites? And I remember in particular, we talked about Life is Strange for quite a bit because it was something George at the moment was playing with their brother. Um, so I left that immediately feeling like, okay, these are some nice people, some people that seem to genuinely care and it wasn't overly corporate and stuff. Um, and then my next interview was with Ryan Brown, who were also works in the marketing team. Um, and that again, it was supposed to be the more kind of professional interview because he was then to be my manager. So it was a lot more kind of marketing focused and I had done like a task for them before that. But again, he felt so laid back. I felt so hurt. And Ryan, who actually also comes from a work, working class background, we quickly learned that we actually have a lot in common in terms of our upbringing and stuff. So we immediately kind of felt connected by that. And nowadays, Ryan is literally my best friend. Um, but yeah, after that interview, then I I put together the money to basically go at, attend EGX for a single day. It was a big big sacrifice for me because I was quite... I was struggling financially. 
also I was sick on that day when I went there, but Oof. I was like, okay, I feel very confident about this, so I'm gonna make the effort to go to EGX because uh, Super Rare Games had a bo- had a booth there. So I went and attended the event, and Ryan even kindly invited me to like industry drinks that were happening after, which were industry only, but he he still invited me, which probably should have given me the hint that oh, I'm probably gonna get this job. Um, and the funniest thing is I actually left those drinks and it, I didn't clock it until Ryan mentioned it later. But when I was heading off, Ryan literally accidentally said to me, oh, I'll see you soon. But I didn't I didn't clock it like at all. And Ryan mentioned it after I started like, oh, yeah, the day you left the drinks, I literally said to you, oh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> OK, no, that's cool. Um, for totally listeners benefit and not my own, what exactly is EGX or at least what does it stand for? Oh, yeah, of course. So EGX is, I don't actually know what the acronym stands for. Is it an acronym? Electron? I don't know. E- anyway, EGX is basically the biggest kind of games event in the UK. So think of in the US like PAX, obviously way bigger, Gamescom, many, many times bigger. But it's basically the equivalent of those in the UK. It's hosted in London yearly. It's, yeah, it's literally like a games event people are. People have booths there, people can go there, play games, and industry folks can go meet other industry people. It's basically like a video games convention. Excellent. Definitely didn't know exactly what that was. Like one of those things like, I know what that is, but I'm not sure, so I'm going to ask. Um, so, you know, if, if you've listened to the show before, you might be like, this seems like a slightly altered usual format. And that's partly because, A, this is an important part of the conversation, but also, when you speak to industry folks, I'm well accustomed to... I can't talk about that for NDA reasons. <laughs> so yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about what you can talk about what is cooking at Super Rare Games? Of course. Um, so at the moment, like I mentioned, we've announced our digital publishing label last uh, January of last year. And since then, we have released four games. Yes, four games. So we started with Crapple Dog in February of last year. Uh, Crapple Dog was actually recently nominated in the MCV Awards for the Accessibility Innovation of the Year, and it was the only indie game in that category. Love we that. didn't win, sadly. We didn't win, sadly, but we were very proud of the developer, very proud to be nominated in that category. Um, so that was our first game. Then we have released Lone Ruin, which is a kind of a roguelike twin stick shooter kind of game. We released that in January of this year. Then we did console ports for games, a game called Post Void. It's kind of, we describe it basically like Doom on drugs. It's the kind of psychedelic first person shooter. I am terrible at it. If, if you have migraine, maybe don't play that. Uh, <laughs> very hard game. But we did that for PlayStation and Switch. Sorry, I really was like Doom on drugs. Because like Doom is like one of those things that can be slightly trippy. Like yeah. if you really get like into it. Um, yeah. you know, despite its age um, sorry I was really distracted by that That's, I'm going like, to check, check that out a little bit further yeah look at yeah it's very very colourful very hectic all the creatures look like something from a, like a sleep paralysis demon sort of thing <laughs> it's very <laughs> <laughs> oh that sounds terrifying great, great marketing for the game <laughs> oh but like yeah but like now I want to play it <laughs> You can get it for you can get it for the cost of a latte. It's very cheap on PlayStation and Switch. Well, we love that, especially again in this economy. Also, <laughs> I'm you know a poor PhD researcher, so you know, as as a, a member of my uh, like uh, Twitch community once said, always buy your indies at full price in AAA games on sale. Never do the way around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anything else you can sort of give us the the scoop on or? Yeah, so the other two games we actually two, one, yeah, we well, said three. So the one more we released is Ocho that we released on the twentieth of April or four twenty, as some hey. people would like. Hey, <laughs> and that was actually so the first game I was the marketing lead for. So I managed the kind of marketing budget and marketing campaign for the entirety of that game. And not that it's all thanks to me, but that is currently our best-selling game uh, that we've released since. I we would started call Digital that Publishing. a classic example of correlation equaling causation. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's what we have out. In terms of things that are coming out, and now I need to be careful because not everything has been announced. Um, well, by the time this podcast comes out, it will have gone out on Twitter. 
uh, in the upcoming Wholesome Direct in June 10th. We wait, may wait, hold have on, something... hold on, hold on. This is going to go out in May. <laughs> yeah, so, we, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, all right, just check it. I don't want to get myself in trouble. <laughs> don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> that's fine. The tweet about the Wholesome Direct has literally gone out just before we started recording this, okay. so <sighs> this is all good. <laughs> so in the Wholesome Direct on June 10th, don't remember the time off the top of my head, we may have something new to show about a game of ours called Townseek, which is a wholesome exploration and trading tra 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 game. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, keep an eye on Wholesome Direct on June 10th. Can I send you my money directly? Um, yes. Okay, excellent. We'll do that. We'll get that sorted. We'll do that after the show. Yeah, because <laughs> that is uh, my type of business. Um, <clears throat> so to, to sort of nitpick, because I, li I like to be informed on these other things, I also love learning, so I, I spent... Too long in academia. Um, yep. But like, what? so marketing, what does that look like? What does a typical day kind of look like? You said you did an entire marketing budget for a game. T tell mm. me more. I'm fascinated. Yeah, marketing, I think, is probably the, one of the most misunderstood just fields in general, especially in games. Um, it, it's a, there's a lot of, lot of, especially in the, kind of the indie scene where it's like, okay, you post a meme here and there on social media, and then you'll get, tens of thousands of likes and your game will be a complete hit. Uh, very unlikely that that's going to happen. Uh, wouldn't bank on that. So that's where kind of marketing comes in. And a lot of what marketing is, is actually not something that the consumer sees. Like when people outside of marketing think of marketing, they think things like, you know, social media, commercial, social media ads, things like that. Yes, that is part of the job. But what, what a lot of marketing is, is actually just research and data a lot of my time is spent on things like i go on steam i look at games that are similar to games we have coming up i look at the reviews for those games look at what type of audiences what kind of other games audiences play i look at pricing of some of like our competitor games and literally write fun fun spreadsheets or fun fun documents about basically competitive competitive research <laughs> research data fun fun spreadsheets with like <laughs> You speak in my language, Annie. This is, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but so it's literally, so a lot of marketing is that kind of back-end stuff. So yeah, looking looking at data, like looking at wish list numbers, thinking of how you can bump up those wish list numbers, speaking to press about various coverage bits, speaking to partners like PlayStation, Sony, Xbox, Unity, whatever, talking about any upcoming opportunities. And then, yes, a part of that is also then things like community management, social media management, uh, paid ad campaigns, although those are done, I think, less and less these days, unless you are someone like Devolver who has millions and millions of dollars in marketing budget. We unfortunately don't have that. Um, but yeah, the way I like to say it is that marketing is pretty much 60, 70 percent of all that kind of research stuff. And then thirty percent of implementing that research into like action. Pardon, pardon my dog joining in the podcast. No, it's fine. <clears throat> Sorry, pardon. He's a very he gets very passionate about marketing. Apparently, um, <laughs> he does this. Um, so obviously, you know, we like to talk about working things. Um, and you've told us as much as you can. But what do you like to do when you aren't working? You touched on it. We talked about your booty picks. I mean, sorry, not just the booty picks in anime. Um, yeah, so there's, I guess, for me, I can talk about my genuine, like, genuine hobbies that have nothing to do with games. And then I do stuff in games outside of my day-to-day -day job. So if we start with the stuff that I genuinely have nothing to do with games, then, yeah, I, I, so I do powerlifting. I train four or five times a week. Uh, I'm one of those crazy people uh, or wild ones who wake up. So on the days I'm going to the office, office I am waking up at 6.15 in the morning to go train in the gym. And then from there, I go directly into the office in London. <laughs> Do you like, you know, have you, have you ever lifted a colleague is, is, is what I want to know. I have not lifted a colleague, but I could probably lift a few of them. So if we're talking peer numbers, and I am—I apologize, I only know kilograms, so anyone who works with pounds will have to convert. But if we're talking about a basic barbell squat, I can do 115 kilos. So anyone who is under that, I can probably squat you. 
then there's this exercise called <laughs> I'm going to get like I can probably squat you I want for you on a t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then there, so there's an exercise called a deadlift, which may not say anything to people outside of lifting. Uh... some sort of limitations if i was able to bench press a let's say 80 90 kilo man then i <laughs> sorry <laughs> no worries so if i was able to bench press a 80 90 kilogram man then i would probably be an olympic athlete so unfortunately i won't be able to bench press most people unless you are 50 kilos or less <laughs> okay that makes sense and i think so again just because i i like to d define learn understand um because cause powerlifting is like a thing like typically you might see on like on a world's strongest person you might see at the Olympics but like I think mm. a lot of people get that confused as just you go and you're doing reps but it's very specific in its aims and you're not just mm -hmm. doing like you know hundreds of reps it's about like the physical mass right and achieving those higher mm -hmm. goals yeah yeah so with and the other thing that often get used interchangeably but are completely different things is bodybuilding and powerlifting those are completely different things so that's the one thing i always like to emphasize is that so bodybuilding they are strong as heck because they are very muscular but where bodybuilding is ultimately all about aesthetics so bodybuilders are those people you see on stage with fake tan they probably have about five percent body fat if that uh so that is bodybuilding so they just want to look as muscular as possible as lean as possible whilst then you look at powerlifting and that's nothing to do with aesthetics there are people with various body types in powerlifting because powerlifting is ultimately just about how much you can lift. So those are the kind of two different things. And with powerlifting specifically, it is, yeah, like you mentioned, it is about goals. So for example, for me, wanting to compete in like amateur powerlifting someday, it's basically what you do is that you can measure it in squats, like I mentioned. Then there is the deadlift that I also mentioned, and then a bench. And basically in those contests, what you do each of these three, and then the winner is the person who has the highest combined total. So for example, if you're better at squatting than deadlifting, you can compensate with that. Or if you're better at benching than one of the other two, you can basically compensate. But yeah, in, in po like powerlifting, it's, it's mostly focused on those specific exercises. And to get to that point, so I work with a personal trainer who does my workout. So I have very, very specific things I go to the gym to do rather than just, oh, I'll turn up in the morning and I do what I feel like doing. So you're definitely one of those people I look at the gym and go, I won't bother asking them if I can use that machine because I'm too scared. <laughs> I promise I'm very friendly, although in the gym I do have a headphones on and I do have a bit of a murderous there but i promise i am very friendly whenever people actually talk to me i just completely zone out when i'm working out well i mean generally i so this this is maybe just me being overly filled with etiquette and also aware that i'm a straight white presenting man but like generally just speaking to anyone at the gym is something i try and avoid yeah i mean to be i can relate to that yeah i mean i don't like being spoken to and i don't speak to people but at the same time i don't mind if someone does that to me unless it's in the middle of my set and someone is being very rude to me which happens from time to time especially being kind of feminine presenting assigned female at birth so there are the occasional gym lad as they're called that comes up to me tries to give me advice or tries to tell me to f speed up so they can take over the machine only for me to then see that they're not even lifting as much as I am. They're like lifting like a quarter of the weight for Instagram pics, and you're like, what, what are you doing, bro? Like, come on. <laughs> like... Um, okay, so that that's, I feel like I've learned a lot there, and that's really cool. Um, so you, you do that, you do power lifting. What else do you do mm -hmm. for fun? Uh, yeah, so we talked about anime. I'm quite an avid kind of an anime consumer. I also read manga. Uh, I'm also studying Japanese language at the moment i started it when i was still at uni then i kind of fell off the wagon during the pandemic and now i'm trying to get back on it um 
And then, funnily enough, I do less and less gaming these days. I think it's probably quite common across the board in games. Like when you start working on them, you play less of them. <laughs> I read and write more about games than I play games nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. But I, I research uh, games. Yeah. Make it make sense. So that... <laughs> So that's kind of the completely not related to games so stuff we, that we I gotta, do. We've got to unpack the anime a bit more because I still haven't gotten over the not just booty pics comment. Because, <laughs> again, I, I am one of those vanilla kind of anime consumers, like your Dragon Balls, your Yu-Gi-Oh's kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yo. And I also just love, I think we need more like animation for adults. I think that's a thing that we've seen grow a little bit. Things oh, like yeah, absolutely. Bojack Horseman and things like that. Oh, um, love that. <laughs> So, like, what, what type of anime are you into? What What's good? What should people be getting on to? Uh, anime recommendations are very difficult. Um, I recently saw, I think it was a rapper. I don't know anything about rap. I'm into metal. But I think it was a rapper who was like, oh, a good entry-level anime is One Piece. And even people who do not watch anime may know of One Piece. And One Piece is that anime series that currently has a thousand plus episodes. Um so to recommend that as a starting point to getting into anime, don't take that advice, basically. And so I, say I, this as I someone... was into a Bleach back in the day when it actually was in a consumable number and then vastly got ahead of what I could consume. Yeah, and I, I, thought I read One Piece. I don't watch One Piece. Uh, and even that is over a thousand chapters. So it's definitely not an entry level thing unless someone is really heavily into binging things, in which case go ahead. But as a gateway anime, I would not recommend it. Uh, but yeah, it really depends on what sort of medium you like in general. Because the thing with, I think a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions around anime. Um, a lot of it, I think, is people who have no idea what anime is think it's like this over the top nonsense or it's this big non series sort of thing. So you know, booties <laughs> or like doing very questionable things with clearly underage characters. I think that's an impression a lot of people have about anime. But the thing about anime is there is so much variety. Uh, I guess Your Name is a good example. It's an Oscar winner, complete, um, amazingly beautiful film. Uh, I saw it in the cinemas and I also recently saw Zuzume, which is from the same director. It's, it's basically a work of art. Uh, but like with any kind of viewable media so films tv series anime also has genres so if you like thriller you can watch thriller anime some great examples are um things like psychopaths um one my favorite anime of all time is called banana fish um... <laughs> <laughs> okay i i have questions and i'm not sure i want the answers to those questions but i'm also <laughs> curious it's a spoiler if i tell you <laughs> oh and that makes me so much more intrigued it's a very underrated anime it's basically t talks about like gangs in like new york city and like how they get mixed with the mafia you wouldn't guess that from a name banana fish but again it's a spoiler if i give you context um so yeah that's thriller if you're into your romance or drama there's things like fruit basket or things like sailor moon which is a classic if you like your action stuff there's things like one punch man my Hero Academia, or if you want something older, things like Bleach and Naruto, but they are tremendously long. Um, and then there's things like A Slice of Life, which is basically just supposed to be like this chill kind of stuff you can watch. It doesn't have much action in it. It's just basically a slice of life. So there's things like March Comes in Like a Lion. Um, that's probably the best example I can think of. So it literally just comes down to what kind of genres do you enjoy? And, and again, I think that's actually illuminating for a lot of people because I think they do see this yeah. anime as like a, a separate other. Because because you're yeah. quite the connoisseur, this is maybe a loaded question, but um, how do you feel about things like, you know, Studio Ghibli being, you know, vastly absorbed in like mass media? Like I feel like anyone can kind of appreciate those. Um, how do you feel about that being kind of like the touch point for anime? Uh, well, I am one of those people. I don't really mind. I know there's a lot of, this kind of oh you watch the normie stuff of anime and i'm like i don't if it's good and i enjoy it i don't care if it's the most like if it's the nichest show out there although i might be a bit sad that more people don't know about it or if it's the most popular thing out there like i read one piece it is probably the number one most popular manga slash anime series in the world at the moment uh but for me personally if you enjoy it and that helps you get into more animes 
then brilliant. The Studio Ghibli movies are perfect entryway. Like, I think one of the first animes I ever saw was Spirited Away, which is also an Oscar winner. So I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. Such a, like, a nice, well-rounded, candid answer. I love that. <laughs> um, so when, when on rare occasions, you do get a chance to play games, apart from, obviously, super rare games, what other stuff do you play? So my favorite franchise of all time is Final Fantasy and literally all my tattoos. Uh, I have a few of them. I have actually not all anymore. I have one that is not Final Fantasy related, but I have I have three tattoos that are Final Fantasy related. And if I were to say it's basically probably my favorite franchise of all time. Uh, it's my kind of comfort series whenever I'm feeling down or I just need to play something familiar. I usually go and play Final Fantasy. Um, <clears throat> but outside of that, uh, what other series I really like? I, I do want to comes to apologies again for interjecting, but I do I do <laughs> feel like we were approaching this point of maybe I was really gonna step brothers it and be like, have we just become best friends? But we've just become <laughs> best friends. Um, Yay! <laughs> are you live on air? You saw this happen because I don't mean to flex, <laughs> but I may have beaten Final Fantasy one through ten in my lifetime. That's, that's so you, good. You can gather I'm also I... a big fan of the series. <laughs> yeah. I've only done 7 to 15, so I've still yet to play 1, 2, 6, because I have this grand dream. I now I could now buy the Pixel remasters, but I have this big dream that one day I'm going to have a streaming-capable PC, and I'm going to stream through every single Final Fantasy game that's out there. But currently I have a crappy laptop that is second-hand, clinging to its last bit of life, so currently that is not possible. <laughs> okay, fair. I have nothing to... <laughs> Okay, but no, sorry, that like yeah, Final Fantasy. Love that. Big fan of it on the show. Big fan of it on stream. I've even like streamed like a few like challenge runs of seven and things like that before. Oh um, brilliant. So yeah, it's you know, I mean I've again I'm literally just plugging myself, but like I've done some panels at PAX East on Final Fantasy Seven. Like oh. you know, like it's it's a huge thing. Big fan. We'll talk about that off air. All good. Other franchises yeah. you're into. <laughs> Uh, so something I've le- kind of learned very recently is that a lot of the franchises I'm really into tend to be Japanese. Again, what a shock! Have... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'm really, I also really like Resident Evil. Recently played the four remake, absolutely loved it. Um, I Viking remember Games, the original I... Resident Evil Four on the GameCube. It was on two discs back in my day. <laughs> Oh, I think I played it once when I was younger, but I was very, very young. Um, <laughs> then, d- 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 what else? I also like Silent Hill. Very big fan of Devil May Cry, Bayonetta, Persona. Persona 4 is the best. I am willing to argue over that. Um, <laughs> uh, Kingdom Hearts. What else? Metal Gear Solid? I, play... I have, funnily enough, never played any Metal Gear Solid game. Okay, so you need to go to season one of this podcast, listen to, I think it's episode nine, with my friend yeah. Marco, a.k.a. Solid Snake. Go and listen why uh, Metal Gear Solid is incredibly important to him. And uh, if that doesn't sell you on the series, I don't know what will. I'll keep that in mind. I, I Funnily enough, I quite have quite a few series. For example, so I grew up, and I've talked about this on Twitter, for example, I grew up as a PlayStation household, and because we were a working class family, we could barely afford our PlayStation 1. So I never had a Nintendo console growing up. So people are always very shocked to hear when I'm like, oh, I have never completed a Mario game. Haven't played Metroid. Haven't played Zelda. None of the Nintendo franchises. Haven't played Kirby. You name it, I haven't played it. And even on like PlayStation or something like Metal Gear Solid, uh, we had a lot of demo discs growing up. I still have some of those PS1 demo discs and I am very nice. proud. I actually have I actually have demo disc number one, which has that dinosaur animation thing. <sighs> That you can... <laughs> so a lot of those kind of traditional series so i'm pretty sure one of those demo discs would have metal gear solid on it and i may have played it but i never had the full game and that was a lot of my gaming experiences growing up because we could only afford a selected few games and because my sister was also very in, and still is very into final fantasy so those are the kind of games you would then put money into so i think again i i kind of resonate with this myself um i think again when you when you think of you have limited disposable income so you want to make good smart mm. choices so i feel like i would maybe get like one new game a year like two yeah. two kind of like maybe like one birthday one christmas kind of thing um mm. but like 
I would want a game that I'd know I would get the most value out of in terms of time. Yeah. So I would always go for a JRPG or like a Pokemon mm-hmm. or something I know I was going to get volume in, right? Because um, yeah. I think, and this is what I still sort of take with me now in that per pound I put into a game, I would like an hour per pound back. So you, mm-hmm. you mentioned like a fabulous super rare games game that was the price of a latte. I'll most certainly get that hour per pound value <laughs> back. Whereas in a day and age where you can buy a triple A AAA game, like I'm not I'm not picking on the series, right? But like something like a Call of Duty where it's a seventy pound game plus DLC, the story campaign is about six hours because the emphasis is playing mm-hmm. online and playing other modes. Like mm-hmm. I would maybe struggle to get 70 hours out of it for the type of game that I enjoy. I am also, you know, blind and suck at FPS, so I tend to play story mode on that type of thing. So you see why that might not be my jam. Um, Yeah. So I I, I resonate with that a lot. Yeah, so I think I play quite a big variety of games. I think online, like online multiplayer is the one, one genre that I just am not into which is a disappointment to a lot of my friends who are like, Anna, you need to play Final Fantasy XIV. And I'm like, A, I don't have that much of time in my life. B, I see how addicted people get to that game. I uh, don't want to get sucked into it. And three, I just don't play online games. It's just like, if I play online, it's with my friends on a Discord call, but I don't personally enjoy the experience of something like, I don't know, Fortnite or Call of Duty or something. It's just not for me personally. Again, I would also really love to play Final Fantasy fourteen, but like both accessibility and also I wish I had the time. <laughs> like yep. I feel like that's gonna be the kind of thing like maybe like post PhD I'll like you know, take like an trying to get like an extended break and maybe play it. But then I'm also yep. planning to do that for like you know, seven rebirth. So swings roundabouts. Games are coming out quicker than I can play them nowadays. It's a yeah, pretty problem much. of being, you know, in my case, old. <laughs> um, so I've got to, I've got to ask you the question though. What is mm. your, what is your favorite Final Fantasy out of the ones you've played? Ten, easily. It's my favorite game of all time. Oof. Okay, that was really like no hesitation. Bang bang. Like, defend your choice. Um. Well, first of all, it's the very first game I have distinct memories of playing classic uh, classic so, impact factor okay yeah uh so this might this might be the peak where you're like Ugh. but when the game came out i was three years old um <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> i remember that game coming out i'm so old <laughs> but yeah so that came out when i was three years old i was so i was a toddler literal toddler and I remember playing it in my like parents' bedroom, and my sister had specifically told me, "Do not touch my Final Fantasy. I fear you're going to save over my safe." I didn't save over her safe, but I played it. I understood absolutely nothing. I didn't know what I was doing, but I had a fun time doing it. Just hammering the X button, running around around Zanakend, taking on that final boss, which is uh, literally just a tutorial. You cannot die for in it. And I basically from there on, I I think I play Final Fantasy. Probably not to completion, but I play it pretty much every year. And um, it's it's given me so many kind of other things. Uh, so in my like teenage years, I made a lot of friends do like Final Fantasy forums who were really into Final Fantasy X. I literally started learning graphics design because of Final Fantasy X because I wanted to make cool graphics I could post on Tumblr when that was a thing. Ah, uh, Tumblr. Um, Good days. <laughs> <laughs> I got way more into creative writing because of Final Fantasy X, so it kind of ties into a lot of things. Also, it's a brilliant game and a beautiful soundtrack. It is very, like, it is very good. I think it's a really interesting choice as well because, like, it's it's one that I think is really quite complex. Like, I remember playing it when I was younger mm. and, like, you know, finishing it off and, like, I I can't quite say doing the the playthrough, but like, you know, watching someone do a let's play and like. There's a lot of like really complicated like political and religious nuance that goes on in Final Fantasy X that like is quite explicit. And like that's yep. like bold <laughs> for when yep. it came out, you know? Okay. Yeah, so then I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge the question a little bit more. That's your favourite, that's completely fine, doesn't matter. Yeah. What do you think is the best one that you've played? Like if you're gonna try and like add some subject objectivity. 
Huh. Hmm. Why you think on that? I'm going to defend my choices. Is seven is my favorite, one of the first ones yep. I played. One of the ones that yep. made me think games could be more than just go left to right and have fun. Um, mm-hmm. But I think nine is objectively the best. It contains all of the mm. best um, parts of the series. The characters have distinct classes. Uh, it has your know, really great side quests. The world map mm-hmm. is fun. Has the best chocobo side quest. Has a banger oh, soundtrack. Cool. Freya. In of itself, Vivi are just in of themselves selling points that just go for the game. Um, and I think it truly like has that essence of what Final Fantasy yo know, is, if that makes sense. Mm. And I'm saying that as someone who played like yo know, four, did play a tiny bit of six, seven, eight, nine, yo know, onwards. Mm. Yeah, well, if we're thinking objectively, I might be kind of inclined to agree with you because also in terms of like lengthwise i think it's quite accessible compared to some of the other games because it's not that long even if you do absolutely everything the game has to offer i don't think it's like even a hundred hours if even that whilst if you do a full run of final fantasy 10 easily up to 160 hours because there's funny things like you can rebuild the entire sphere grid which is gonna take you hours upon hours of grinding but in terms of like accessibility and things like that i think nine yeah Probably agree with you that nine might be the best, although the card game is terrible. <laughs> that that if they had, had the card game from eight, yep. I think everyone would be happy. Yep. <laughs> I'm excellent. I'm we agree. I'm, well, you heard it here first. <laughs> Final Fantasy nine, objectively the best. Excellent. Ten also banger. Um, <laughs> so also like a whole bunch of other series in there as well. I think what what are you most excited to play next? Hmm. Well, it might, might genuinely be Final Fantasy 16. That might be the game that I will have to buy a PlayStation 5 for, which is actually next month. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but I will attempt. Um, so that might be the closest upcoming release that I can think of. It would have been Resident Evil 4 if we had recorded it a bit earlier, but that's now out. I played it, very much enjoy- enjoyed it. And then after Final Fantasy 16, I'm a boring Final Fantasy fan and say the next one I'm most looking forward to is probably 7 Rebirth. <laughs> See, that's the game that I'm going to hope to steal away a PS5 from one of my friends who owns one for yeah. like a month and just yeah. like do a lot of that. Just really good yeah. at it. Because I, I, I'm not like, I'm not 100% out. I'm not a completionist by any means. Mm. I think I have like seven or eight Platinums on PlayStation. Never been mm-hmm. motivated. Mostly because there's always another game I want to play. Um, yeah. But I, I got the Platinum for Remake. I, oh yeah, oh yeah, and you know I'm going I'm to do the same thing on Rebirth because no matter what it takes, because it's just a matter of pride. I've just got it. Do you know what I mean? I'm yeah, I, I on the other hand have a platinum for all the games except for the Pixel remasters and Final Fantasy Thirteen, but I have a platinum for seven, seven remake, eight, nine, ten, ten two, twelve, fifteen. <laughs> okay, how did you? How many controllers did you break in the process of getting the jump rope trophy? Two. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, lower than I was expected. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I think that that trophy alone makes that platinum the hardest out of all the Final Fantasy games. I will I will grind the entire sphere grid in ten ten times again, but I will re- categorically refuse to ever again do that skip rope to a thousand jumps. I absolutely refuse to do that. So, so again, for context, there is a jump rope minigame where you, you you jump over the rope that you have to do within, like, it's within, like, the first hour. Right? Wait, no, hold on. Yeah. You can go back and do it, right? Am I... Yeah, I think, I think disc three, well, remaster don't have discs, but I still talk about discs. Disc three of PS1. You, you, you have to do to it, it specifically, like at specific points, so you can access one of the cities, and you have to do a thousand jumps consecutively. But like, it's not programmed well, so like the speed changes, it doesn't have a rhythm. Like, yo, know, which is worse, dodging the lightning bolts or doing the jump rope? Everyone says jump rope. Oh yeah, the the lightning bolts easy because there's a spot in Thunder Blaze that you can literally keep looping around to get always hit by the light by the lightning at the same exact point. With the jump rope, your con- there's controller delay. It's badly programmed. It's badly timed. It's just a nightmare. Like I'm convinced a lot of it will just come down to luck. It doesn't matter how good you are at it. 
Um, and I think you, you'll you possibly agree with this opinion. It's one I've heard from a few communities, including that of uh, Death Unites on Twitch. Um, but like Square, particularly with Final Fantasies, are just bad at doing trophies. Yeah, I yeah, I'd agree with that. I think the seven the seven remake trophies weren't particularly bad. Um then I think eight is just too easy. Uh they either make them really difficult or too easy. And I think eight is very simple. I mean I guess some people like that. Basically just complete the game. Get get all the GFs, which for anyone not familiar with Final Fantasy Eight, doesn't mean girlfriends, unfortunately, but means guardian forces. Um but yeah, it's usually one extreme or the other with Square. But I think Remake had a pretty decent trophy list. There was some challenge there, like playing the game through again on the higher difficulty. Yeah, that beating the um, battle chamber as well. That was that was fun. Yeah. Good times. I actually like. I really. I'm very tempted to replay Remake, and I don't really have the time to. But I also really want it. Just like a new fresh yeah. file ahead of Rebirth. Uh, might do that. Might treat myself. Anywho, we're going off topic. Um, this is a podcast. I'm a host. Um, okay, so one of the other things I always like to ask is, um, have you like played Red or anything? You know, viewed anything recently that you sort of like want to give a shout out to? Like we were talking anime recommendations and stuff, but anything that you're like, oh, you might not have heard or seen of this, you want to check it out. Uh, yeah, so I briefly mentioned it previously. So I recently saw a the anime film Suzume, um, which is from, if anyone has seen Your Name, it was quite big. Well, obviously it won an Oscar, and I think it's the highest crossing anime film of all time now. So it's from the same director, and I saw that a couple of weeks ago in the cinemas. It might not be in the cinemas anymore, but I would imagine you can get it on on demand on various kind of rental services. Um, but it's basically a... Oh, these films are difficult to explain without spoiling them. Um, so it's about this girl who lives in kind of a small rural town, and he basically she basically meets this this guy who is a bit of a like of I guess you could call him like a guardian. So he his job is to keep these sort of doors, as they call them, closed. And if they don't, there's these beasts that come out of those doors and basically cause earthquakes which is a very kind of interesting way of explaining why earthquakes are so frequent in, in Japan. And the well, the reason it was particularly touching to me is because I am quite invested in Japanese history. Um, so if there's people who are kind of know the Japanese history from the past, like kind of 10, 15 years, there's, there's references to a particular, well, disaster that happened some time ago in that film. That personally touched me because I have kind of, I've read stories about people who were impacted by it, and I think it gets quite beautifully referenced in the film. Um, and I don't think you need to be an anime fan to watch that film. It doesn't. It does have some like quirky anime moments, but I think it's really just a it's just a piece of art. It's like you would go see the latest Disney, but I think personally better. <laughs> okay, I'm like you know I need she keeps selling me on these things. She's saying these things in such a tantalizing way and then i'm like of course you work in marketing that's literally your job <laughs> i'm like of course like this is why I'm, I'm i've got my credit card out ready to buy things after this episode <laughs> like and you should too check it out <laughs> um okay that's cool i'm definitely gonna I'm, I'm gonna look out for that i i love a good recommendation um <clears throat> so this is sort of a couple of like my, my sort of favorite questions that i get to on the show um yeah. but if you had no limitations whatsoever. What would be your big blue sky project? So you have infinite access to time, resources, people of your choice. What would you do? This is a really tough question for me. I guess I could. I have like two answers. One of those would be like a game I would like to work on. It's not necessarily even, oh, this is a studio I want to work on, but a project I would love to work on. So if we were talking about a game and I had infinite money, is I would basically like to create make a a persona like game so people who have played persona those kind of game mechanics that are in that and all those like building relationships and stuff so a persona like game but with an adult cast so rather than high schoolers they would be adults it would be an RPG but it would also be a horror game and it would have that kind of persona like mechanics in it uh, I have never. I think Parasite Eve is like a, a horror RPG from like early Square days, but I have never played that. 
Uh, so basically a horror RPG would be my like dream game project to do like marketing or maybe even writing for. <laughs> so like Persona meets It, Stephen King's It, kind of like adults facing fears, scary stuff, that much together? Yeah, something like that. Um, Atlas has this other, they have a puzzle game called Catherine, which has an adult cast. Uh, so basically, just take an adult cast from something like that and just plant it into a Persona-like gameplay and then have adults with adult problems. I cannot really relate to high school romances and things like that. So <laughs> yeah, that I would think be my... That sounds cool. And I think, again, like Catherine is like a really good like touch win because that's one of those games that like you wouldn't necessarily want to buy with a responsible adult in the shop because it's definitely designed to look overly sort of sexualized. But, like, yeah. while it's got that kind of anime, kind of, like, you know, booty pit kind of element to it, mm. the actual point is that it's about addressing, like, adult problems in, like, mm -hmm. a jokey sort of sci-fi way, which, is you know, is a cool way of kind of looking at it. Yeah. So, yeah, so that would be my, like, dream game to work on. But if I if I could work on just a, a, anything... um. I would probably, I like the games industry. We could go do a whole other podcast about the issues in the games industry because there is loads. Um, but if it was to do like something non-game specific, then I would probably, so I am quite passionate about like diversity and inclusivity, which I haven't spoken too much about in this podcast. But if we have time, I can talk about all that stuff that I'm doing in games. But yes. if I had the infinite, <laughs> yes. We make so time. if I had the, <laughs> if I had the infinite money, then I would probably like to uh, do some sort of kind of diversity and inclusivity work specifically for games. Either maybe it would be like, it doesn't maybe sound too exciting for some people, but for me, it would be like do some sort of consulting to companies and all that sort of stuff, which isn't the most exciting work in the world to some people. But for me, that would be like amazing because I could get to work in games and I could do more to try and make the industry a bit bit of a better place basically but unfortunately at the moment i don't have the capabilities to kind of go off my on my own to start doing that sort of work but maybe someday starting a company who's got time you know <laughs> um okay excellent so then my next question is extensively reading notes i don't know why another question but i was like trying to check this is right so um on the back of that we talked blue sky ideas but is there anyone or any sort of group of people that you that has inspired you and that you want to give a shout out to because i think you know we talk about this journey of how you ended up where you are and why that's informed what you're doing but i also think it's nice to really give like a shout out to some of the great people that have maybe impacted or influenced that in any way mm -hmm. uh well the person i always like shouting about especially on twitter is uh ryan brown who is the kind of well we all have difficult titles as super rare but he's kind of the best dev person slash our PR and communications director sort of thing. Uh, but Ryan, especially because we do come from similar backgrounds, has inspired me not only as someone who does come from that background, but also as just a person who we should all kind of aspire to be in the games industry. So Ryan has been in the industry for over a decade at this point. Um, and he frequently, when I talk to other people, he everyone just talks about how Ryan is so like. First of all, he's very non-businessy, which is which is why a lot of indie developers we sp speak to really like Ryan because he's very approachable. He's also just incredibly kind. I don't think I've met a person who has said a bad thing about Ryan. He tends to be quite universally liked, and despite having been in the industry for so long, he's just incredibly humble, sometimes to a fault. Um, um like he could ask for a lot more kind of credit and even praise for the work he has done but he just he does what he does out of just genuine passion for the games industry and he's particularly passionate about like small indie developers so ryan has this kind of passion project project called the mixtape which we which super rare is publishing but we make no money out of it and it's literally just like really really small grassroots game developers from sites like itch.io that we pay to be on a mixtape, mixtape, we give them visibility, we pay them to be on a mixtape, and then they can get their games not only physically preserved, 
but in the hands of customers. And these are games that probably would ne- never otherwise be seen by consumers. And Ryan is really passionate about kind of helping these sort of small indie developers. And I just, yeah, I often say, say, well, Ryan hates what I say, but I want to be, I want to be like Ryan when I quote unquote grow up, <laughs> even though he's only <laughs> four years older than me. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I am conscious of the fact that you, you you're slowly getting more eradicated by sunlight. Uh, yeah. Do you want to do you want to like change your lighting situation? Um, I don't. Yes, to, like... if you don't mind. No, that's fine. I, can I will quickly close. I will filibuster that in the meantime because I had the pleasure of meeting Ryan, so I'll chat about that. Um... Yes, I'll close my curtain. <laughs> Say, got to got to think about the guests on this show. But uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting Ryan at the same event at which I met Annie. Um, very lovely, genuinely seemed like a great human. Uh, and is one of the people that I get, I think, the majority of my gaming news from on Twitter. So, Ryan, all round sort of good egg, I would say, from my limited interaction. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, you know, when you just like you meet someone, you're like, oh, yeah, they, they, they seem cool. You get a really good vibe. Um, he, was, he was definitely one of those people. Um, and also, if I remember correctly, had a really cool Omari costume at that party as well, which was really, really dope. That was me filibustering. Annie's back. We can have some more conversation. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's nice. And I think it's 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 just really nice. I, I always like look forward to the answer to those questions more than any other on the show because it's really heartwarming to hear people talk about like people that they think are awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I also look like I think I really might turn that into the clip of like Ryan's who I want to be when I grow up because that's excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um so edi then equality diversity and inclusion something i'm very passionate yeah. about Let, let's talk about that what are you doing in regards to that at the moment how can how can i help you with it what can we do to make that a bigger thing because it's something that i feel the world let alone the game industry needs yeah absolutely so uh i do a lot and i've that's i probably did a bit too much last year uh to the point that i probably burned myself out a little bit, but not to dwell on the negatives. Uh, so basically, as soon as I started in the games industry, eh, which was December 2021, so I've now been here for a year and a half, which is hard to believe because I've done so much. Um, but pretty much the moment I started, I started working on something that I am now hoping to maybe launch this summer, exclusive scoop. Um, yes. <laughs> so. I am currently working on a project that is aiming to specifically support people who are new to the games industry. There's a, we have a definition with it. So I have a whole team working with me on this and we're basically aiming to establish a community for people who are new to the industry. Um, and may would like to meet other people who are new to the industry, but would also like some sort of networking opportunities because what I found when I joined the games industry and spoke to other people especially after the pandemic is that you are new to the industry, you go to games events and it is terrifying uh, because you meet these like industry veterans and they, in some ways, they almost feel like superstars, so to speak. It's like, I don't know how to talk to these people. They've been in the industry for 10, 15, 20 years. And I am here with my a year or less experience, not knowing what I'm doing, very intimidated. And especially then when you mix something like social anxiety or introversion into that mix, it can be very overwhelming. So the project I'm working on is hoping to kind of help people first to meet each other so they know there's other people who are new to things. And then there's me and my lovely committee there who are also still relatively new to the industry, but who are willing to then do things like, for example, we have a plan of maybe organizing some sort of a get together and develop Brighton this year where we can be like, hey, are you new to the industry? You want to come to a mixer networking event? You can come to ours. And then we might also welcome like industry veterans who are keen to meet people who are new to the industry and come talk to those people who are new to the industry. So that's something that is not, I've spoken about it a little bit. Uh, I can't reveal the name or anything yet because we're going to do a big launch thing, hopefully relatively soon. So that's what I've been working on. Then another thing that that's actually how we met. I started Game Devs North which is really funny when you realize I don't live in the north. I live near London. Um... <laughs> All the more reasons to start something northern. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and that Game Devs North started completely accidentally. Um, 
and it kind of ties into the other projects I was talking about. So, and again, also kind of my working class background. So game games industry is very southern heavy in the UK. Um, and I would just, in, I think in the US, it's very coast coastal, uh, but focusing on the UK, a lot of events are in the south. Develop Brighton is literally Brighton. You cannot go more southern than Brighton, pretty much. You you can't. That's e a fact. Yeah. yeah. Um, EGX that we talked about earlier. Again, London WSD, which is an indie-specific games convention, also in London. There used to be a, a thing a thing called Rest that was a games convention in Birmingham. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen anymore. WSD kind of replaced that. So there's really nothing there up north there's a, there's the okay there's like small things but there's nothing really big there um so com again completely accidentally last august around gamescom i wasn't lucky enough to go um but i was like i still want to meet people and i know other people are like fomo or fear of missing out as it's as it's as it's called um i was like okay i want to do a meetup I put up a simple Twitter poll and I was like, if I were to do a games industry meetup, would people prefer London or would they prefer Manchester? And Manchester won that poll by quite a bit. So I was like, okay, I'll do something in Manchester. Um, and I did two things. One of them was a kind of a gathering in a pub, in a pixel bar. I have quite a good relationship with them now. I've organized quite a few things with them. And the other one, because I wanted to be as accessible as possible, and I know people may not like going into bars for various reasons. So I then did a picnic on a different day in a park where we just sit down, talk. Um, but what ended up happening there is that it really kind of blew up on Twitter. And I ended up having people who were in Cologne in Germany at Gamescom being like, oh, I wish I was at this thing in Manchester, but I'm in Cologne in Germany. <laughs> Sorry, part of my brain is just having to, like... I would rather be in Manchester. Like, wow, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that. I have some great friends from Manchester. I have nothing particularly against Manchester. It's very grey as a city. Um <laughs> but like I guess F FOMO is that real, I guess. Yeah. So that happened that it was supposed to be a one time thing. But then people came back to me and were like, Okay, Annie, when is the next one? And I was like, Oh, I wasn't intending to do a next one. Then I got an idea for a Halloween party. But I realized like, oh, I'm going to get, I am, I will get very overwhelmed if I'm doing this by myself. And that's where the lovely Rosie from Safe in Our World stepped in and kind of, kind of joined Games, Games Dev North with me. And we put together the Halloween party. And for context, people who, who may not know this, probably a lot of people won't know this. So we did a Halloween charity party, again, at Pixel by Manchester, where we were raising money for Safe in Our World. Um, and that was quite successful. We sold out the tickets for that event and literally everything we, every, every single, like all the profit we made from that went to safe in our world. So what's very important for me in, in terms of Game Devs North is that I could genuinely take a cut because it is quite a lot of effort for me to especially go from London to up north, but I don't. Um, so we were very lucky that the Halloween party was sponsored by Luminal Games. Um, so they covered our venue. So we could just then donate literally all the tickets proceedings to, ch to charity. And from what I heard and what I saw, and I'm I'm sure Christopher can, can <laughs> comment on his behalf, I think people really enjoyed it. And people have already asked if we're going to do another one this year. And, you know, as as the winner of Best Costume, um, you know, uh, it, it was an excellent party. Um, my personal ploy of attaching business cards to Milky Bars went really well. Um, it was a great time. I think because the thing is that you, you you mentioned this like it the games industry feels so southern centric. You know, it feels yeah. like I mean, I I being from the north, like you people say, Chris, it's it's one train, it's two hours from you know Liverpool, London, but like mm. that train costs easily fifty, sixty, seventy quid. You know, yeah. and then like if you if don't, you're lucky. if you're lucky. Then if yeah. there's any sort of like, if it's gone after eight o'clock, you're going to have to stay in London, you know, that type of thing. And like, you know, there's a genuine level of inaccessibility to it. Um, yeah. So to have like a, a northern sort of base thing, I mean, I know like there's a, a, a cross brand in here, but like there's a game dev network in Liverpool, which I only found out about like yeah. last month. And I'm like, because mm -hmm. it, you know, it I'd sort of always known it, but didn't like know it, know it. And Liverpool actually has a really big game dev community. 
you know there yeah. are loads of really cool studios i'm like why do we not celebrate this more you know like mm-hmm. why do we not make the most of this in terms of like you know wonder like i know uh t- t- like you know companies have like uh, i'm trying to avoid naming too many names like you know ran by leeds and in the north like it exists mm-hmm. there these are companies and publishers who games you've played that are mm-hmm. nearby um so it definitely kind of baffles me that we don't do more and i think it's really cool to see people doing it in a way of me sort of sticking my nose in as someone who is industry adjacent i try and convince myself i'm part of the gaming industry but you know i then like rub shoulders with people like yourself and then i'm like i'm definitely on the outside looking in but i want to be on the inside of the building uh well for me it's another one of those twitter discourses that happens every year what is a game dev a lot of people would say i'm not a game dev because i am not a game developer but i think like as long as you're contributing something to games like i would say that's like you are in the games industry so that would that is journalists that is educators if you're contributing something to video games for me then you are in the games industry and i don't care how much other people like to argue against that well i feel first i i feel personally i feel personally validated so that's an excellent that's an excellent thing for me um anything sort of else like edi you'd like to talk about it as i say it's something I'm, i'm very passionate about i think in spaces uh yeah so aside outside of those two things which are kind of the i guess the named things of things that exist as something um i do i am quite heavily involved in safe in our world which is kind of also how we met i rosie is one of my closest friends in the world not just in the industry um and i've been quite heavily involved in safe in our world pretty much since its foundation i believe i was one of the first people to do any sort of fundraising for them back in like 2019 December I raised a couple of hundred pounds for while I was still because I was quite heavily involved in like the video game society at my university so I raised a couple of hundred pounds there and I've been kind of involved ever since so now I'm actually an official ambassador this year so that's something I'm involved in (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and then actually as part of my job although I don't get to contribute as much time to it as I would personally like. Um, I am I am in charge of like the accessibility policies at Super Rare Games. So since I started, we've def- we've, we've like made our marketing way more accessible. I have, have told our community manager that if they don't include alt text into all our posts, I will come after them. They, ha- they are now including alt text in all of our posts. Just threaten um, to lift them. Like, listen, <laughs> listen. Uh, mate, if you don't do it, I will lift you. <laughs> so I've done, I've implemented that, and then I'm currently also working on doing things like color contrast checks on things, for example, like email marketing that goes out to make sure that people who have any sort of visual impairments can actually read what they're what's like on the screen, so it's like the colors aren't too close together. Uh, in terms I of love like being able to stuff. read things, Ugh. Ugh. love that. <laughs> Uh, and then things like just making sure that like the text version of our email looks and reads okay, because I think a lot of companies just kind of ignore it because very few people actually use the like text, plain text version of the email and the auto generated one is awful. Um, so I literally just manually check every single email that goes out and then just on like a wider scale, um, I, I am hoping to get all more involved in like looking into like accessibility in our games and just like accessibility of our brand in general. So it's something I don't have that much time to work on at the moment, but I am hoping that I will maybe when things calm down a little bit, it's a busy period at the moment. Um, so that's another thing I'm doing. And and then I like to do a quite, a, so I am very lucky to have quite a wide network as someone who has been in the industry for only a year and a half. So when you take that into consideration, I know quite a lot of people and I acknowledge that I'm very fortunate in that sense. So I like to use my network for things like fundraising whenever I can. Uh, So literally just today, I announced this thing called Safe Spaces, which I did last year as well. So Safe Spaces um, is a one fundraising campaign I run, run in June to raise money for Pride, because it's Pride Month for any kind of LGBTQ plus courses. Last year, we raised almost 5,400 pounds for a charity called AKT, which is a charity in the UK that is helping uh, basically LGBTQ plus youth that are either in danger of homelessness or already homeless. 
So that's what we did last year. And today I've announced kind of part two of that, I guess. Um, and we are, this year we are hoping to raise money for a charity in the US that is basically fighting for LGBTQ plus rights in, well, across the US. And if anyone has read any news recently, they can see that especially trans rights are getting absolutely like destroyed in the US at the moment. So I figured that would be a good cause for this year. The, the, um, U, the US uh, uh, are not doing great when it comes to the rights of anyone that isn't a straight white cis able dude. Um, yeah. It's not, don't like to see it. Don't, no, not a fan. Mm -mm. Yeah, so that's what we're doing this year. And basically what Safe Spaces is, that is literally we're raising money uh, for charity. And while we're raising money for charity, people can take any sort of fitness challenge they want. And it's really literally open to anyone, regardless of their fitness level. Like last year we had, I myself ran a hundred K in the course of the June month. Hate running. That's the only way I can convince myself to do running. Not in single, not in a single go. go. <laughs> no, no, but e even so a hundred K is still quite a lot. Yeah, I, I, I hated it. The only way I can convince myself to run if it's for a good cause, but there was people who did it because they genuinely enjoyed it. <laughs> Also, I feel like it, there's that added dimension because, like, what I do know of fitness is that, like, running like that is counterproductive to, like, powerlifting goals, which adds, yeah. like, that extra layer of, like, torture to it, I guess. Like, that's really charitable <laughs> giving on every level. Yeah. So there's, but yeah, so that's one of the kind of more extreme things that people did. But there was one person on the campaign, for example, who lives in San Francisco, and what they did in June was they literally just made a, they just walked every single day to a different kind of LGBTQ plus landmark in San Francisco because there's lots of them in there. And then just wrote a small tweet about it. And that was their fitness challenge. They got some steps in and then they got to learn something about local history. And then there was literally everything in between. There was a person who there's a machine in the gym called the Stairmaster, which is literally an infinite staircase. They climbed Mount Kilimanjaro by using the Stairmaster. And I don't remember, it was like 250,000 stairs or something. I have used the Stairmaster. I would rather take on the actual Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's basically, it's open to everyone. We have a lovely Discord community. So if anyone listening listening to this is keen to join in June. The links the will be attached my... wherever you found this episode. Yes. So yeah, please join us. It's literally, we had like the community last year was lovely and no one got judged on what they did. Some people had a simple goal of like, oh, I want to walk 50,000 steps in June. And that's fine. Uh, you don't have to be a marathon runner or a very, very heavy power lifter person like me. Literally everyone's welcome. If you want to help raise money for charity, you are welcome. And if you kind of come up with a challenge, the community is there to help. And I'm sure as a charity donation uh, incentive, if you lay if you weigh less than hundred k, Annie will lift you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that can be arranged. Hey, I'm not judging what anyone's into. I'm just trying to help raise money for charity. Okay, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Um, no, that's great. I just it's it's something I really I'm very passionate about, and I love hearing about other people who are passionate about it and. And mm -hmm. and you know I I'll, I'll put my hands up and say I'm my I'm more passionate maybe more than active and that's just because you know doing a PhD yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Um, but to hear people who are actively doing stuff, it just oh it really makes me really 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 happy. Um, so as we sort of wind down, then one of the things I like to do is a quick fire round. Um, pew pew pew. <laughs> pew pew pew. You are going to a biome of your choice. Because I personally wouldn't go to a tropical desert island. Have you seen me? Um, and you're going on a bit of a retreat. On that retreat, you are taking with you one film, one album, one book, and one video game. Uh, if it comes as a physical collection or comes in one set, you can have that. So, like, you know, for example, the Pixel Remasters collection, you can physically buy it as one thing. You can have that. Yep. The game and its DLC, um, etc. What are you taking with you, and where are you going? What type of? Oh, uh, where am I? I guess? <laughs> oh, where am I going? I guess I would be going to Japan. But if I were to take stuff with me that I I want to consume while I'm there, I wouldn't be going to like Tokyo or anything. I would go like it's, Japanese it's a, countryside. It's a, it's a biodome of that ilk, so it's kind of detached. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, yeah, I would go to Japan, but to be fair, I would also like I, I want to see the big cities in Japan, but I also want to see the lovely countryside and stay in like an onsen or an inn um, and just relax, look at the beautiful countryside. But with that out of the way, that's where I would go. Uh, one film. Uh, ba, 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 ba. You can I also have probably... TV shows as well. I'm flexible. I am bad with TV shows. I'm good with anime, which I guess count as TV shows. But name any recent TV show, I probably haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> a film. Uh, uh, one of my favorite films is Grand Budapest Hotel. So let's say I'll take that. Nice. Uh, one album. I'm going to say Meteora by Linkin Park, because it's a very important album to me. Uh, one book. Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo is my favorite book of all time. Very grim, not a pleasant read. Uh, don't read it if you're looking for a good time. Um, <laughs> and a video game, Final Fantasy X, and we've already talked about it. <laughs> I really, I want that as like, if I ever write an autobiography, I want that to be like the line, the forward. If you're after a good time, don't read this. That sounds great. Just that single paragraph and then turn page. <laughs> yep, just like. If you're willing to sign it off, I just think that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, no, that that's great. I think um, some solid choices. I love the way that you were like you kind of felt very assured. I've had people like, even though you know, spoilers. I send the questions out in advance. Who like get yeah. very panicked once I get to this part of the episode. <laughs> um, so that again, that assurance, very good. Love to see that. Um, touching on the album, you said you're into metal. Any sort of like other yep. close contenders that were maybe up there? Uh, so in terms of albums, not really, because the, I'm the kind of music listener that I have a sl- playlist on Spotify that's rather mix of artists and songs and albums rather than entire albums. But if we're talking about just whole albums, the only other close competitor would probably be Semp Eternal from Bring Me the Horizon, which was quite impactful to me as a teenager, uh, since I was a teenager around that time. Uh, the album came out Um, but if we're talking about just like artists one of my favorite artists at this at the moment is a uh, band called Blind Channel which some people may or may not remember as the Finnish Eurovision entry a few years ago Um, I am also really into a German band called Electric Callboy which I actually saw live a few weeks ago probably one of the best concerts I've been to because it felt like a mixture of a concert and a rave was brilliant i've never seen audience so engaged at a concert everyone was having a great time and they did things like a cover of uh let it go from frozen beautiful i've posted a clip of it on my twitter if anyone wants to see that um but then i also there's another finnish band that i'm really into well which actually released a album literally i believe last week called cyan kicks um that's not metal really that's more kind of rock alt alt rock sort of music i always try to recommend it to people because i don't think they have made a single bad album i think all of their songs are brilliant um and it doesn't have any of the kind of screaming that is quite common for metal which i know is painful for a lot of people listening to scream or any kind of yelling cyan kicks is brilliant good vibes can recommend to anyone um but yeah i think those are probably probably some of the contenders if we're ignoring Linkin Park and Bring Me the Horizon. Okay, nice. I, I always like that music again, another one of my passions, so I like to ask about it. So, you know, peel that back a little bit. Some good choice. Oh, yeah. Um. So, the last question then is I like to turn the tables upon myself and uh, I ask, is there anything you would like to ask me? Uh, again, for full clarity, I've had the what are you doing with your PhD question. The answer was not the same both times I was asked that. And the biodome question myself, but is there anything that you want to ask me? Okay, brilliant. Uh, there's a few things, but if we go back to what you just said about being really into music, do you play an instrument yourself? I um, was wearing flannel shirts before it was cool, and obviously I'm a you know, white presenting man with a beard, so of course I play acoustic guitar. Um, I don't quite do the whole full like you know, like you're at a party, everyone's kind of like you know have has taken some substances. There's a guy with an acoustic guitar who won't stop playing. He's now looking at you. He looks a bit like a pervert on a bus kind of thing. Haven't quite reached that level. You know, it's like anyway, here's Wonder Wall. Um, I'm definitely at the oh, campfire yeah. <laughs> level um, yeah. where I I enjoy it more than ever anything. There's definitely like a, an unlisted playlist of like my jams on YouTube that I occasionally send to people. 
Um, but I enjoy the process of playing and like you know sort of like writing lyrics more than than like I would to like you know perform. I've done an open mic night once. That was fun. Take that off my bucket list. Um, because I I play and sing and like I can play like a smidge of harmonica. So like yeah, I really go for like the Bob Dylan kind of sound. Um, with that. So like yeah, it's 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 just something that I really enjoy. I don't get enough time to do yeah. it. I feel like because yeah. of work commitments um again in this economy uh i feel like i always have to like interchange what hobby i do mm. and like guitar sometimes just gets put on the back burner because like any skill based thing you don't do it for five minutes you're then really bad at it and it takes a while to then regain that kind of mastery unfortunately oh yeah yeah absolutely so i asked that question because well i i played the bass for about six years um so i started in like elementary school and then up until high school i unfortunately had to sell my bass when i moved to the uk because it was would have been expensive to bring with me but i have recently been thinking about maybe getting back to it but after having not played for seven years like you said i would probably have to learn the basics again <laughs> it, de- it always come comes back to you it just it takes a little while to it. so so we can yeah. also start a band so we we really did become best friends on this episode, I think. Oh, perfect! Because I've also got an acoustic guitar, because of course, a, a acoustic and an electric guitar. So you layer those sounds together, we'll get some drum beats. We'll be flying. Yeah, excellent. There we go. We're sorted. Yeah, Rosie looks like the type of lass that can that can smash some drums. I bet she'll be able to do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know that you mentioned. I'm sure she could. She has like well bending anger like we all do she looks like she could <laughs> i'm gonna leave that one alone i'm gonna let you comment because you are good friends with rosie and i'm not <laughs> I, can send, I can send send her this clip <laughs> um any what well, you mean she's gonna definitely watch the episode how could she not um okay all it remains for me to do is you know annie just say thanks for being on the show i really appreciate this it's been a great chat um I feel like I, I, I've I learned a lot about things that I didn't know I would learn about, which is honestly why I do the show, because it's more for my own entertainment than anyone else's. Um, so yeah, thank you for adding to, to this plethora of knowledge um, and sharing your experiences with us. I think it's it's a thing that people maybe take for granted because there's just so many like mm. sort of podcasts, but having someone come on and, you know, I will let slip, you mentioned this was your first podcast appearance, you know, you've done exceptionally well. Love that. Oh, brilliant. You know, to just come on and just talk about stuff. It's it's not an easy thing to do. Um so thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we roll credits? Uh well, first of all, just thanks for having me. Like I like you said, it is my first time. I believe all the times that whenever I go to events, Safe in Our World spots me and Rosie puts me in front of a camera. Maybe that has done some good um so yes thanks for having me it's been really lovely chatting with you and i hope the people listening will also enjoy these waves of discussion that we've had we've gone some wild topics to more wild topics in the past two hours exactly and um obviously all the links will be attached wherever you found this episode where is the best place people to find you your twitter i believe you've mentioned yeah so twitter is the place where i'm chronically online the most so if you want to Follow me up there, drop me a DM, just stay in touch. Twitter is the easiest place to do that. Excellent. Right. Annie, thank you so much. For those watching along, I'm going to click on the ending screen button now. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'll see you again next time. As always, as we say on this show, until next time, look after your mind, body, and soul. Bye-bye. <laughs>